Aboriginal people, um, you know, embraced uh, the European economy, and I'm, I'm going to limit my discussions to British Columbia because I can be very specific here. Um, so through the late 19th century, uh, the railway was built to British Columbia in 1885, uh, and actually 1885 is a real turning point um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One reason is it allows lots of white immigrants into the territory after that. So uh, before 1885, it was hard to get here. You had to come around by, uh, by ship from uh, around South America uh, or uh, arduous trek overland. Suddenly you can buy a ticket in Montreal and be here in five or six days by train. Um, so a uh, massive white immigration into the territory after 1885. The other thing that happens is um, uh, all these uh, Chinese who are working on the railway, and, and there were 10,000, maybe 15,000 Chinese working on the railway, are suddenly unemployed. And they need work, and they'll do, take any work. And um, un see, the First Nations um, had an economy here before Europeans arrived. They didn't need Europeans to survive. The, you know, if, if the wages fell or if there was no job, they just went back to fishing and hunting and they were fine. Uh, the Chinese didn't have access to those resources or the skills, so they had to take any job at any price uh, to feed themselves. So you have this huge influx of low-wage labor uh, which starts to displace indigenous people from many of the jobs they did before. Uh, and then uh, 1885 was also the year the government decides that this um, potlatch system that the First Nations had here, this idea of accumulating wealth and giving it away, was, um, was a problem, that it was uh, uh, somehow and not Christian and not capitalist and, um, uh, you know, they associated all kinds of uh, evil things with these potlatch feasts. So they pushed the government to ban the potlatch. So the Indian Act is changed in 1885 and the potlatch is made illegal. So, you know, you can see a bunch of things coming together here. The reason why Native people went to work was to accumulate wealth for the potlatch, make that illegal. Uh, allow this, uh, well, both white immigrants and Chinese laborers kind of make this huge influx. Having said that, 1885 is still a boom period in British Columbia. So Native people are still uh, working and doing fairly well. Uh, but starting after about 1900, you see a kind of uh, displacement. Uh, World War I comes along, 1914, and uh, labor shortage. You know, lots of men go off to the front, um, and uh, they need workers. So you can see there in that period, indigenous people being brought back into all kinds of industries because they need the labor. After the war, a period of, you know, uh, I guess, um, uh, uh, the 20s are a period of economic boom, so Native people are finding work. The 30s is the Depression. Native people then start to go back to their old economy, but they find in the 30s that uh, the government has started to legislate against many of the, their kind of hunting and fishing practices. They're no longer able to use the fish traps they used to use to catch fish because that's considered by the government, well, they would say unfair, but in fact what they're doing is protecting the, the resources for the fish canneries and the commercial fishery. Um, labor is becoming, and agricultural labor is becoming mechanized. Um, the, uh, yeah, hunting regulations start to prevent them from hunting all year round. So indigenous people find the 30s are becoming harder and harder to subsist as they used to. Uh, and then 1939 comes along, World War II breaks out. Again, a labor shortage. Native people are drawn into the shipbuilding industry and all kinds of non-traditional industries. End of the war. Uh, white men come back, indigenous people are again pushed out, but by the 50s their, their economy, their subsistence economy is, is uh, much diminished. And the other thing that happens after the Second War is the government, um, for reasons independent of First Nations, starts to expand the welfare state. So we get the family allowance, we get old age pension, we start to get something we, we now call welfare, they used to call it relief. Um, and so indigenous people, uh, you can actually see the, the Indian agents saying, if, if we impose these hunting restrictions on these people, we're going to force them onto welfare. And uh, um, the, the other thing that happens uh, through the century, through the 20th century, is um, as white labor becomes available, is this kind of racist preference for white labor over indigenous and, and uh, Asian labor. And so many places won't hire native people. Uh, the native people, uh, as early as the 1870s, are denied the vote. And uh, many professions require that you be a voter in order to become, for example, if you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or a pharmacist, you had to uh, be franchised. So Native people couldn't do that. 
If you wanted to have a general store out in the country, which is kind of, you know, a small business, or if you wanted to run a hotel or a pub, you couldn't do it if you were in indigenous, partly because of racism, uh, uh, but partly because the law said that Native people couldn't buy or sell alcohol, which of course is the main item of trade in a hotel, in a pub, or even in a general store. So um, there are all kinds of ways through the 20th century, uh, but from my point of view, you know, the World War II is a, is a turning point because uh, after Native people were, were drawn into the workforce then, lots of employment, high wages, and then at the end of the war, they're pushed out and they've got really nowhere to go but the welfare state.